Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mateo Chavez Lewis. Welcome back to Music Theater Theory. Oh. Today I have a very special guest with me, as you can see. This is Chrislyn and Chetta. Hey, happy to be here. Excited. We worked together doing uh, Beats and Intentions yes, last we, year. Yeah, for Nuit Blanche, we composed music together. And when we were working together on uh, Babel was the name of the project. Right, right, right. We kept saying we need to do a Hades Town duet. This is true. This is true. This is a song from the musical Hades Town, which has a big, long history. It really shows the value of editing and developing in a musical. Musicals are really hard to write. They are, and they take, like this one took like I think 13 years it took to write. Yeah, so the, the show shopping. initially was in 2006. She was like, I don't think it really has a future, so she turned it into just a concept album of, of songs and, uh, and then kind of put it to bed and said, all right, on to the next project. And then she met Rachel Chavkin, who said, listen, you got some gold here. Let's mine it. And so Rachel helped Aeneas Mitchell, who wrote the songs, develop the show for the stage, and it finally made it to Broadway in 2019. Mm -hmm. So nine years after the concept album came out, and 13 years exactly yeah. after the first production. I think it also workshopped here in, um, in um, Canada. Yeah, in Edmonton. In Edmonton, did, it did. Yeah, they did, yeah, yeah. They did a workshop See? in London. They did, yes. And then in Edmonton at the Citadel, I believe. Anais Mitchell grew up in Vermont, and her dad was an author, so she was always very influenced by folk music, like American folk music, and by storytelling. And so it makes sense that this musical she wrote is about why we tell stories. Exactly, and the importance of an artist. And it borrows a lot from folk music vernaculars and uh, big band jazz musical styles. It doesn't use a lot of traditional musical theater style music. And so what I find really interesting about this show, uh, there's a lot of things I find very interesting about this show. It's a fascinating show. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I find very, very interesting, specifically about the score and the music, is how Aeneas stays away from all of the musical theater cliches and the palette of the musical theater writer, if you will, and sticks to the palette of the folk music writer, but manages to tell the story borrowing techniques from folk music traditions instead of borrowing techniques from musical theater traditions. It's so much not a musical theater piece specifically. Rachel Chavkin calls it a poetry piece. Um, Aeneas calls it an opera. And in terms of like who gets cast in it, like Justin Vernon from Bonnie Vare sang Orpheus on the concept album. So it's oh. not like she didn't get Ben Platt. Rachel and Aeneas also have talked a lot in interviews about how Louisiana is kind of the, the inspiration for the show. Partially because, you know, you've got this like underground jazz scene in New Orleans that really focuses on community and storytelling and that kind of environment was what they wanted for the aesthetic design of the show. But also because there's a lot of themes about like climate change and the environment and the failing marriage between Persephone, the goddess of nature, and Hades, the god of industry. And so because there's so many themes about climate change, Louisiana also works really well because of like oil and drilling and industry there. So this song is a song written for Eurydice. And Aeneas Mitchell actually played this role, Eurydice, in the original productions and then sang Eurydice's part in the 2010 concept album. I would have loved to see that. Oh wow, that would have been amazing. Well, you can listen to the concept album. Uh... <laughs> so this is a song for Eurydice. It was originally written uh, for, I think it was actually originally only in the live show once Rachel revived it. It wasn't on the concept album initially. This song? Mm -hmm. It was on the live recording, but it wasn't on the concept album. Okay. I okay. think so. I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna, fact I'm gonna, check him, everyone fact check him. I'm gonna fact check myself actually right now. <laughs> Uh -huh. Oh, he right. I'm right. He's right. I'm right. I'm right. Wait, so she wrote this for the for the show for the musical then. Mm-hmm. And then it was a re oh, and then it was a solo, and then they made it into a duet. So they made it a solo for the for yeah for the London production and the Edmonton production, I think as well. Oh. But then they added this duet section for Orpheus to come in and start singing as well. So this was only used on Broadway. Basically, oh. I think so. Yeah, I'm okay. pretty sure. But it's one of the most like clever songs in the show. A lot of this, a lot of this show lives very much in the heart center. It's very like emotional and ethereal. But this, this has a little bit of braininess to it. The it the words to this, which I think makes sense because Eurydice is such a brainy character. Yes. And it's called "All I've Ever Known." Didn't even know that I was 
So already you can hear like, I mean, Anais Mitchell wrote this on guitar, so I'm playing it on on mm. piano because uh, I don't play guitar. But you can tell that it, it wasn't written in the same vein as Jason Robert Brown or Pacific and Paul, you know? Oh, yeah. It's very just chord based and it relies a lot on the percussion for the rhythm and stuff. Yeah. Which is something you don't see a lot in musical theater because a lot of musical theater is workshopped with just a piano. So a lot of the rhythmic elements of the songs are written into the instrumentation and not just in the percussion. Not just in percussion. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. The other thing is you hear this at the top of the piano, this uh, octave, the octave jump. Jumps. And this comes back in this show a lot, most noticeably near the end of the show. Oh my god, yes it does. <laughs> All these, these high octave jumps yeah, at the top jumps. of the piano, right? And so I'm not sure what the connection is. Like, what do you what do you think that? Probably, means? I associate anything high and anything octave with Orpheus. It could be a motif. It could be like representing oh. him. It could be anything. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's very interesting. Yeah. It comes back at the very end of the show, where in the in the moment that Orpheus turns back to look at Eurydice. Spoiler alert. Um, oh. <laughs> and Eurydice gets sent back to the underworld. And so there's something about the fact that in that moment where Orpheus looks back at Eurydice, there's a motif from this song that Orpheus and Eurydice sing together about their connection. But it's in a different context now. It's mm -hmm. suspenseful. It's not, this is a flutter. This is exciting. Yeah. So, like, it's a lovey kind of exciting feeling. The other one's more suspenseful and you're like, you're like, oh, yeah. oh my god, you look you're back. Like, oh my god, you look oh my back. God, like, Why? Why would you look back? In the stage show, like, Eurydice, like, disappears into the floor and it's really dramatic and epic and... Spoiler alert. Turn my color to the wind. This is how it's always been. All I've ever known is how to hold my own. Do you see what I mean about that being very, like, these lyrics are very brainy, like, they're very cerebral, they're very clever. They're very clever, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, all I've ever known is how to hold my own, but now I want to hold you. It's wordplay, mm -hmm. you know? Wind also is, is played in this song mm -hmm. and throughout the whole show, right? Mm -hmm. Turn my color to the wind, the wind will never change on us. Yeah. Right? And then, like, that, it references, like, that song at the very beginning. Anyway, the wind blows. And she turned her collar and turned my collar. Yeah, exactly. I there's, just follow there's with... Something about, there's something about the wind as a theme in this, yes, in this show. Yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. Wind being fate. Yes. You know? Yes, like, that's what it is. I mean, you get at the beginning the, the three fates singing about the wind and they go, wind comes up. Ooh. And they are, they yeah. are the sound of the wind. And then, yeah, you already see goes, do you hear that sound? Yeah. And she's hearing the wind for the first time. And she goes, move. Another town. So we're we're we're, we're crafting this <laughs> hypothesis about the about the theme yeah. of the wind in Hades Town, yes. where the very first time Eurydice hears the wind, she moves to another town where she meets Orpheus. You know, mm -hmm. it's the very first time she follows her her the wind, yeah. fate, the fate, and yeah. fate brings her to Orpheus, and fate, like like uh, Hermes says at the very end, like. The story always ends the same way, but we tell it again anyways. Like, it's it was always meant to end this way, but we... we uh... It's the nature of fate. Yeah. 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 Crazy. There's something, there's something <laughs> there. There's something about that imagery. Yeah. It, a lot of imagery. Like I said, Aeneas and Rachel have called it a poetry piece. You there know, you go. So the, those images that we repeat are very, very important in this show. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think they're meant to have, like, very specific, concrete meanings. I that's, don't think there's one but answer. That's but that's what makes it so great. There's, it's a feeling, you know? That exactly. You can call it fate, you can call it something, you can call it inspiration. But that's what's so good, they don't hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. Right? The audience is like, oh, what, what am I going to do when the chips are down? What am I going to do? Whoa. The other thing is that it's hard for her to say this. You know, it's hard for her to admit that she wants to hold him. Because that's being vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, of course. She's a tough, she's a tough cookie, you know? She's been on her own. <laughs> she's been, she was like, I don't need a man, but oh my gosh, uh, this is all I've known, mm -hmm. but now I'm feeling something else, and I want to be with you. And so you see this all the time in musicals where a character has a really hard time saying something, and in musical yeah. theater, the commonly used technique 
is like I said this retardando fermata because like, that's holding the thought exactly yeah. if it was if this was a typical musical it would sound like all I've ever known is how to hold my own but now I want to hold you you know that would be there would be this slow down this pause but it's folk music so the rhythm keeps going it does keep going but what's really cool also are the breaks between that's exactly. her digesting. Exactly. It's not It's not like you said. It's not like Fermata's Ritz or anything like that. It's the breaks. So they communicate the exact same thing. Exactly. This is hard for me to say. But instead of communicating it with the musical theater vocabulary, which is like slowing down and stopping, stopping. Mm -hmm. they communicate it in the folk vocabulary, which is like this tag, you know, this repeat. So you have... All I've ever known is how to hold my own. This is hard for me to say. I'm going to not say it yet. Let me try again. And... But now I want to hold you too. There you go. You take me in your arms and suddenly there's sunlight all around me. Everything bright and warm and shining like it never did before. So again, this is borrowing from folk music, this flat seventh note. That note is, um, folk music uses that flat seven all the time. Like if you think about, um, we're captive on the carousel of time. That, that flat seven. And it's also the same note from, Lover, tell me when we're wed, who's gonna buy the wedding bed? Times! Times being my thing. Wow. Look in at in that. a different key. Right, but right, right. Um, the but the yeah. but the same note in the scale. So that that flat seven is is very much from folk music. So I have this hypothesis that where most of the music in this show sounds very much like big brass, big band jazz from New Orleans, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is like a lot of the the vibe of the world is based on uh, Preservation Hall from New Orleans. But Orpheus and Eurydice's music together very much comes from folk music, like American folk music. Like, you know, mm. Joni Mitchell, Bob yeah. Dylan. And so I'm wondering if there's something there about the value of songwriting in American folk music. That in, in jazz, the, the songs are not the most important part, right? It's the interpretation. Oh, I see. But then in American folk music, it's so much about, like, the words you're saying. Well, maybe that they use it to make it more intimate. That's true, actually. Because big band, it's a party. They're at a bar, they're at a pub, or whatever, mm -hmm. right? But then maybe that folk element is used to make it a little bit more focused on them, the relationship, and how they feel about each other and what they're saying to each other. Yeah, that's super true. Because the big band, like, I mean, inherently, like, folk music, you can play with one person and a guitar, but a big band is big. A big band is big. <laughs> this is the, this is the, this is the, these are the million dollar uh, ideas that you watch this channel for. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So we've got, um, you heard there, all I've ever known is how to hold my own, the pause again. Yep, yep. But which is not a musical theater pause with a written a fermata, it's a folk pause with just an instrumental break and then a repeat. Yeah. Then we've got, this is a very musical theater moment coming up. Yeah. And this is because in musical theater, because folk music often is just sung by the songwriter, it's usually one voice singing the song from front to back. Mm -hmm. But in musical theater, obviously, you've got lots of different characters, which means you've got lots of different voices, which means you've got lots of different voice types, which means you've probably got to have lots of different keys. Because if you gave this to Orpheus and told Orpheus, okay, sing this in the same key, he would go, 
all I've ever known is how to hold my own. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not a good key for, a good, yeah. for, for a tenor. So they change the keys up a fourth, which is what they almost always do in, in musical theater duets. Oh, oh, in duets, okay, in okay. In duets. They love to go up a fourth because the classic, like, alto soprano range and the classic, like, baritone tenor range mm -hmm. are about a perfect fourth or a perfect fifth apart, usually, for okay. the most part. Okay. In a very broad, general sense. And artistically and musically, it makes sense because it's a shift in idea. It's a shift in how she thinks now. Do you yeah. See how it works, or is it just yes, because... yes, and it's um because because key change are, key changes are generally a shift in, in idea, idea, but it you'll notice it doesn't really sound like a key change, and that's the other reason they use the fourth and the fifth because those the 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 perfect fourth up and the perfect fifth up. Those two keys are so closely related okay. to the original key. It's mm -hmm. very easy to transition into them without it feeling like key change. Okay, so just different color. Exactly. Okay. So it's just a different place in the voice, and it's almost exclusively for vocal purposes. Mm. Just just so that, okay, now we have the tenor sing in a range that's comfor comfortable for a tenor. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Because if it was for an idea purpose, they might do it in a little bit less of a of a subtle way. It'd be so more you, you could dramatic go, and exactly. drastic. Yeah. Now I wanna hold you. Now I wanna hold you. And then I don't wanna go back to the lonely life. You know. Like, <laughs> but you'll notice that's not how it sounds. What they right. do is they actually pedal on they use that flat seventh note yep and we're in d flat major initially yeah. Eurydice sings in d flat major then we use that flat seven which is the c flat c by yeah. um and then that resolves to the g flat major and suddenly we're in g flat major because we've been pedaling like we've been uh stay pedaling is a term for like you're staying on the same chord and you're not moving. Yep. So we've been pedaling on this C flat for this whole section. I don't want to hold you, hold you close. I don't want to ever have to let you go. Now I want to hold you, hold you tight. I don't want to go back to the lonely life. And finally it resolves to a G flat major because C flat is the flat seven in D flat major, so it works. But it's also the fourth in G flat major. Look at that. Okay. Exactly. Nice. So it tricks your ear. It, it pedals on this for long enough that you kind of forget that it's the flat seventh of D flat major. And then finally, it goes to G flat major. Oh, nice. So that when Orpheus comes in, you didn't really notice there was a key change. It's just in a better key for Orpheus to sing it in, in his in, range. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. That's really awesome. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, Mateo. I mean, yeah. Hey, thank you. But yeah. So now we're in G flat major. I don't know how or why or who am I that I should get to hold you. When I saw you all alone against the sky, it's like I'd known you all alone. I knew you before we met And I don't even know you yet All I know is you're someone I have always known All I know is you're someone I have always known And I don't even know you now I wanna hold you, hold you close I don't wanna ever have to let you go now we're back into this section of pedaling on the flat seven. Flat we're now on the flat seven of G flat major, which is mm -hmm. F flat instead of yeah. before when we were on the flat seven of D flat, D -flat major, C which was flat. exactly, yes. Music, music theory stuff. My brain hurts. It's too early in the morning <laughs> for this. So then we've got this nice little harmony and then we transition back into D flat major, which it was originally. Mm. And when we do that, is we go back to G flat major the chord and then to D flat major because G flat major the chord is obviously it's the first chord in G flat major the scale but it's also the fourth, fourth chord D in D flat major the key. exactly mm -hmm. so that's why this like this relationship of the perfect fourth works in in musicals they use it all the time because you have to have a tenor and a soprano sing 
they each have to sing in a range that's comfortable for them, but you don't want it to feel like, like we said, big key change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You okay. just want it to be subtle and it's only just adjusting the key so that it's a little bit better for the person's voice. It doesn't feel like a big dramatic moment. It just feels like this, okay, this is better suited now. Wow. Now I want to hold you, hold you close. I don't want to ever have to let you go. Suddenly the sunlight, bright and warm. Suddenly I'm holding the world, G flat major 7 in my arms. And now, so G flat major 7 the chord, and now yeah. A flat. And then we have this, this beautiful little violin line. With the flat third, which is also a very like folksy note. Mm. So that, that ending was in the London and Citadel versions. If you listen to like the live, the original oh. cast recording from 2017 or whenever it was, yes. that yes. ending was there. Yeah. But the duet part at the begin uh, uh, or and the or duet pieces. part in the middle wasn't there. And so it never went first. into G flat major. Exactly. Yeah. Orpheus's verse wasn't there. Okay. And do you like it as a duet or as what you heard on the live or the concert? I mean the live version. Is it the live? What did you say? The the live the the live album the live album the did you like it yeah did you it like it that version the end. um I kind of think I kind of think that on on the one hand I mean it's nice that we're setting up how important Orpheus and Eurydice are to each other and not just one way but on the other hand I kind of feel like we do that already because Orpheus goes up to Eurydice and says come home with me like right at the beginning so I don't know if we need him to sing more about Mm -hmm. how he feels like they're meant for each other because it's like girl we know yeah 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 okay but maybe it was just like a thing you're like looking at him when they were workshopping and like he needs mm -hmm. to do something yeah he was just he, <laughs> he was just sitting just there didn't. he was just sitting there like you know with his with his sweet little Reeve Carney smile being like <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. He was just, yeah he needs to sing now yeah. and so they wrote that it could be that situation but yeah. but then at the end um something else that's that's very folk about this is that um, the song form is yes. not really verse chorus verse chorus you know it's very kind of like one verse one verse and then like a B section mm -hmm. and then an A section and then a B section and so it's a it's more jazzy it's more A A B A mm -hmm. and then what's also folk about it is that it's not just A A B A there's also this ending part that's totally different Mm -hmm. So we have the A section, which is obviously the like, I was alone so long, I didn't even know that I was alone, etc. Mm -hmm. Then we have the B section, which is the, now I'm gonna hold you, and then it repeats a few times, A, B, A, B. Um, but then this ending of, say that you hold me forever, is totally new material at the very very end mm -hmm. which is not something you see a lot in musical theater musical theater often will end with like a bigger more grandiose version of the chorus of you've the already chorus heard. Exactly. exactly if this was a musical if this was like a, a classic musical theater musical like this song would end with instead of say that you'll hold me forever it, it would go all i know is i'll hold my own. you know <laughs> so it doesn't go like that um because it's folk um, and it ends with this really sweet little back and forth with Eurydice and Orpheus, which was in the original nice. uh, version when the song was written. Mm -hmm. And it ends on, this is also 
a moment where most musical theater writers would go, it will always be like this, and then they would add like a, a, a weird note to the chord. Or a button. And <laughs> <laughs> it will always be like this. Scene change. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would come in with uh, like uh, this button. Applause. And then, Hold. and then. Yeah. <laughs> then the scene starts and the dialogue starts. And then someone slams a book down on a desk and goes, I can't believe yeah. the bank is making me close the farm, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that a lot of musical theater writers would do is add like a weird note to the chord, you know what I mean? Like, because they're saying, the words they're saying is, it will always be like this. Mm -hmm. But the audience knows that it's not always going to be like this yes. and they're going to get sucked into the underworld and die. Yeah. So that dramatic irony, a lot of musical theater writers really love to emphasize dramatic irony with weird notes in the chords. Oh. You know, it would be like, uh, then it will always be like this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Button. <laughs> but it's not like that. It's it just like ends. Just a major chord. And the audience is left with the dramatic irony to create that for themselves. Because this is like, this is On just a- major a, chord, that's amazing. Yeah, it's just a folk song. Yeah, it's just a folk song, yeah. And I think also part of that is because the music in this show feels like it comes directly from the characters, especially with Orpheus, because he's the songwriter. Yeah. Um, so in the, in the creation of most musicals, the music serves the purpose of telling us things that maybe even the character doesn't know um mm. you know and and this is true in like film scoring as well you know like the the character doesn't know that there's a shark underneath them but you still hear mm. right but in this anything the character doesn't know doesn't show up in the in the music because the music comes directly from the character I see. Okay, okay. You know? Yep, yep, yep. And so Orpheus doesn't know it's not always going to be like this. He's like, yeah, I found a love of my life. It's great. Yeah. There's never going to be any more problems in my life. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. And then nice. usually the musical theater writer would tell the audience, but there are going to be problems. But in this, it's not the musical theater writer talking. Well, cause... It's literally just Orpheus. <laughs> and you'd hope that they know it's an old song. It's, an, it's like an old tale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, you get those people in the theater like <gasps> when they like turn around. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? Like, people who know the story of Orpheus and Eurydice would know. Like, dude, but, like, you're 2,000 years what? late on that dude, spoiler. Dude, like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, one more thing I want to point out about the folk influences of this song um, are the rhymes. If you watch my video next week, um, I'm going to have a video coming out about uh, imperfect versus perfect rhymes and about using rhymes in your songwriting. Um, a perfect rhyme basically is when it sounds exactly the same. Like, my name will never be the same. They're exactly the same. Claim, aim, fame. But an imperfect rhyme is when they sound like they rhyme, but they don't exactly rhyme. Like, my name has nothing to gain. Yeah. Close, but it's m instead of n. You know, and in musical theater and Stephen Sondheim, the late great mm. Stephen Sondheim, moment of silence for Stephen Sondheim. I'm, I'm going to do a whole Stephen Sondheim yeah, video at some point. Yeah, you Stephen have Sondheim. to. Yeah. Um, but Stephen Sondheim would always say that perfect rhymes are really, really important in musical theater because you can only hear the song once. When you go to a musical. And you need to be able, the audience needs to be able to hear that. Exactly. So perfect rhymes it. are just a little bit clearer. Yes. And I agree with that to some extent. I think that audiences today are much more familiar with imperfect rhymes because imperfect rhymes show up so much in our pop music. Yes. And they show up a lot in folk music as well. Um, like Joni Mitchell doesn't use perfect rhymes, right? Bob Dylan doesn't use perfect rhymes. And so neither does Aeneas Mitchell. She rhymes, turn my collar to the wind. This is how it's always been. Mm. Been, d been. All over the place, these imperfect rhymes. At the end here, there's there's no rhymes in this whole ending section unless you count forever 
each other Mm -hmm. and change on us be like this very very distanced from rhymes both of them are very they're they're very imperfect they don't they don't even really sound alike but it allows her to get away with not putting any any real rhymes in because it sounds close enough to a rhyme that it's still musical to the ear you know if it was say that you'll hold me for an eternity say that the wind won't change on us say that we'll stay with each other it would just it wouldn't sound as musical yeah it wouldn't yeah but say that you'll hold me forever and then say that we'll stay with each Each other other. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds musical, even though it's not really a rhyme, even. Mm-hmm. But it sound, it, they're close enough to a rhyme that it sounds kind of like it serves the purpose of a rhyme. Yes. And that's very folk music. Okay. Folk music is like, what's a rhyme? It's, these words sound good together, who cares? So, that's a little bit about all I've ever known from Hadestown and about yeah. Hadestown in general. Uh, everyone give it up for Chrislyn Anchetta. Oh, She's amazing. Give it up for Mateo. Oh, thank yes. you. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, me? Oh my god, stop. Hit the subscribe button. Give him a thumbs up too thanks thank you everybody so <laughs> much for you. watching once again my name is Mateo Chavez Lewis this I'm is Chris Lincetta and this has been music theater theory oh